Hey gang. All right, so I had a thought. You ready for this? Ready? I had a thought. Um, why don't we try injecting some signals through the amplifier card just to see if it's, you know, totally dead or what have you, and which I, I really, really doubt. I've got, uh, I've got the phone grounded to the tape deck and I'm gonna be using this alligator clip coming off the hot lead from the headphone output. And I'm gonna use this, okay, as a probe for injecting signal. Wanna point out that the circuit board here is loose. This circuit board would be mounted inside the chassis and the foil run that runs along the bottom edge would actually be electrically connected to the frame using screws to hold the circuit board in place. Because I need the board loose, what I've done is I've simply taken clip lead attached to the frame where it would have attached to the circuit board. That way I've got a complete circuit. All right, again, pointing out that this particular unit here is actually positive ground. The positive DC source, the batteries here are actually, the positive side is going to ground, all right? Primarily, and this is again, I'm just gonna, this is my opinion, all right? But that's because they are using PNP transistors, okay? PNP transistors, the current actually flows in the opposite direction, okay? It's actually, the current is gonna be flowing from the collector through the transistor to the emitter, collector to emitter. So the electrons wanna to get to ground. Ground in this case is gonna be positive, so it's actually work going the other way. All right, so now let's try injecting into the input of the circuit card and the input coming off of the record play switch is right here. I'm not hearing anything, so real quick. Just make sure, yes, okay. That's what I should be hearing through the amplifier card. So there's nothing audible through the input to the card. I'm gonna just tap on these capacitors because typically, uh, not all the time, but typically you just can inject a signal by touching the top of a capacitor. Well, hello. That's after the first transistor or the first stage in this uh, recorder. Now, so the other two stages are obviously working, um, but we'll go through it. Okay, that's really, really faint. Probably can't hear that, but I can. That's a little bit better, a little bit more. Okay, I'm working my way through the circuit. All right, that's further through the circuit. Okay, that's the last capacitor in the circuit for the push-pull amplifier. And I know that because <clears throat> I have a schematic. I've actually gone through the circuit, but I'm still not getting anything at the input. But right after the input amplifier is that. So consequently, something is going on. Now, the first assumption would be, okay, um, transistor's blown, okay? Because I'm injecting into the amplifier, nothing, but coming out, going to the next stage, because that capacitor couples that first stage to the second, where I am, where I'm actually hearing tone is on this capacitor right there, which is basically the input to the volume control. All right, so there's tone there, but not here. And what's in the middle? Well, an active component called a transistor. All right, but not making any assumptions. So let's take a closer look at this. I'm looking for an issue with this circuit board. Grab my trusty magnifying glass. All right, and what I really need to do is get some close-up looks at this circuit board. And, <laughs> okay. All right, confession time. I use solder wick, okay? When it comes to soldering things, I use solder wick. Now, I've been using solder wick for decades. Apparently what's happened here is the solder wick has removed when I basically unsoldered the capacitors and put all the new capacitors in here. Okay, the solder wick removed a portion of solder from circuit adjacent, electrically connected, but adjacent to where the capacitor went in. Oops, my bad. Consequently, let's see here. 
I'll bet dollars to donuts if I just tack solder this, it looks like it's probably the lead for the base of the transistor of the first stage. Reels turning, so it's just, everything's working, batteries are all in place. I don't know if you can hear this, but there's static coming out of the speaker. I have a good feeling about this. So let's go back to the tone generator. I'm actually going to reduce the level of attenuation I was in, you know, injecting before at zero dB. I'm actually reducing this now to 65 dB, negative 65 dB, and I'm going to the input Problem is solved. Cool, all right, um, turn that off. And I'm going to remove all of these other clip leads here. And I'm gonna go ahead and solder this board, uh, not solder, I'm going to put the screws into this board. I'm gonna put the screws to it. Um, and what I tend to do is to take a little post-it and the screws that are holding the PCB, printed circuit board, those go there. These are the screws that came out of the case. Those are the first set of screws that actually came out of the whole thing. I took four screws to hold it together. That screw, it's gonna fall right off of there. It's not like you can put it on the end of your screwdriver. It's not gonna happen. So the magnetized screwdriver is not going to work. So I'm just going to set those in place. I know a lot of people say, oh, don't waste video on doing the screws and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, well, um, we're real close on this. I just got a good feeling. I don't even know what's on this tape. If I'm not mistaken, this is the tape that came with this recorder uh, when I picked this up 20 years ago. So the question I'm having here is why is there no audio? This is behaving as though there is a loose connection. Again, these wires are so tiny. I'm still hearing scratchy, you know, static coming out of the speaker. So, and I can inject tone into the very input, which means that something is not coming off the head, which is strange. I haven't really been on this side of the board much. What I have noticed is if we go to the play mode is that I can get it to work by virtue of moving this board around. Okay, and as I have stated countless times here thus far, is that these tiny wires are just so easily broken. The negative wire coming from the tape head, which is supposed to go to ground based on the schematic diagram, is the blue wire, which is supposed to go to chassis ground and it broke off. Just moving that board around a little bit and lo and behold, here it is, just hanging in midair. And we get back to the fact that there's no telling if there's anything on this tape, especially in the spot where I'm at, but making contact, okay. Perhaps nothing there. So. One of the fun things about working on old tape recorders and so forth, <laughs> um, especially with the tape recorders, is that you never quite know what you're getting. Um, you know, especially if uh, you buy something and it comes with a tape already on it, you find it at a flea market or Goodwill or one of those places. What I want to try to show you here is right in here. This right here is the record play switch. Press the record button and this switch moves. It's basically a four pole double throw switch. You can see in the uh, schematic diagram um, that basically it's just switching the tape head input to the amplifier versus a microphone going to the amplifier. And that's the record play switch. 
but right behind here is this blue wire is loose and it needs to be grounded to this circuit board here. There's not much in the way of wire left on there, so I'm going to have to trim that. But this blue wire is coming off the tape head on the other side of the chassis. What I'm going to try to do here is strip off just enough insulation to give me... There's like two strands out of what may have been... It might have had nine strands, but only two of them are actually visible now because it actually all broke off. So here's what I'm going to do. I, I can try to use these, but I'm just afraid I'm going to grip that wire and try to pull that insulation off and actually pull the wire right through and rip it right off the tape head on the other side. So here's a little trick that I've often used where you take this, uh, take a razor blade, hold the end of the wire and just scribe just a little bit just enough to where you can feel metal underneath it okay not enough to really do any work because there because what we're going to do next support the wire below the cut that i just made pull that insulation off and you got to get a grip on it but then of course gripping it means you're also gripping the metal the strands underneath that insulation so i'm actually going to just put my put a little bit of pressure on there grip the wire it takes a little bit of dexterity and just pull that insulation off. And there it is, right there, right underneath there. It's just enough. In fact, that's that's way more. That's twice as much wire as I actually need to do the job. Just looking at the other side here, making sure that I haven't done anything to the tape head on this side. And it did pull the wire a little bit, so I'm just going to pull some back. And... <laughs> I'm not even going to touch it beyond that point. I'm going to flow some solder onto the tip of the iron with the wire on top. So basically sneak the tip of the iron up underneath the wire, touch the iron with the solder, and it'll flow onto the wire, and boom, that's it. I mean, just one, just the tiniest little dollop of solder on there. This should actually have audio from the tape. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to very gently... Drop these screws back in here. Just snug the screw up and then back it off quarter to half a turn. When you're putting stuff back together again, it's just a good idea like the cover, you're putting the cover back onto a receiver or a tape recorder or phonograph, what have you. And what you end up doing is, is that what I recommend is putting all the screws in, but nothing tight, okay? Get all the screws in place and then on the last screw, that's when you start tightening them up. Just, you know, get them on like that because obviously this came apart so it can go back together again, but that allows all the screw holes to line up the way it's supposed to, okay? And that's when you tighten up all the screws. All right, so here we go. Moment of truth. And nothing. Okay, the brake didn't release, so it's not playing. Recording, testing, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, well, there's obviously audio on there. There's a recording on there. I will mention that, yeah, that uh, person on there counting from one to ten, sounded like the speed was wrong. Okay, again, with, with rim drives, the tape speed is not constant. Well, when they manufactured this, they knew that. So they give you a speed control. can't fix the southern accent, but I can adjust the speed. And that, I don't know that it's accurate because I don't have any idea who the person is on this tape. I don't know what they're supposed to sound like, but the fact that it recorded at all and at whatever speed it was recorded, you can adjust the speed for a normal-ish sounding playback. Now, I did notice that, again, the reason it wouldn't 
play is the uh, the brake had not released. Now, in the stop mode, there's a brake right in here that engages when you go to play mode. That's actually going to back away from the reels. Okay, right now it's touching the reels, both reels, take up and the supply side. And you hit the play button and that's supposed to release to let the reels spin. Okay, hit stop and the stop button pushes that up there so that it keeps the reels from turning on their own. Cool. Okay, now that we've got the electronics part of this all taken care of, uh, going to do the uh, cleaning it up, little cosmetic work, uh, lubrication, stuff like that. It's in functional condition. But what I want to do now is make sure that everything is lubricated. Because this is rim drive, it really cannot afford to have much in the way of friction in the tape path as the tape comes from the supply side past the tape head onto the take up side. So with the brakes engaged, you can't hardly tell, but reaching in here um, with the, uh, with your finger, all right, you're gonna go to play mode. So actually we'll just let it go to play mode because those brakes are fully engaged when that stop button is pressed. But just see how easily this reel actually spins. Well, that's, you know, I wouldn't expect it to be much better than that. Okay. Uh, now go to rewind mode. That's going to move the motor onto the supply side and see how easily this one spins. Well, it spins really freely. I mean, I'm, I'm impressed. All right. But I may be impressed, but I'm not going to take it at face value. So I want to break these reels loose. And you do this kind of gently because you never know some of these, not, not the Iowa's so much, but um, sometimes they actually put reverse threads on there because this reel is spinning this way. So naturally they'd want that to tighten up if in fact it was actually going to be engaging with the screw part on this. But this one, this reel here spins in the opposite direction. So is this actually reverse thread or not? Don't know. So I'm going to just grab it. Yep. Okay. So it's not reverse thread. Both of these come off in standard unscrewing motion. So just take these off here. I'm going to set it down there. Be careful because there is often a washer on there. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, so I'm just going to lift that table off of there. There doesn't seem to be a washer on there. And I am not seeing one on this back side. Sometimes they'll cling to the reel table. This one didn't cling to the reel table, but there is one right on here. I'll take this one off. Just making sure there's not a washer on there. Because there could be. I mean, even if it wasn't manufactured with a washer on the top of that thing. You know, in 60 years, somebody might have taken it apart, cleaned it, put a washer on there. So, and if it's working with the washer, I kind of want to put it back that way. Yeah, there is a, a, a nylon washer on here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the washers off get out my tech wipes and I want to clean that washer up. I want to clean all that old lubricant off of there and I'm just going to use the alcohol take that washer off of there all right and even on the white piece of paper there you can see how dirty that is so I'm going to bend the paper over there and I'm just going to work it very gently to get any of that old lubricant and debris off of there. Okay. What I also like to do is to just take a post it because it'll stick to the bench. 
and put that on there so I can keep an eye on it. Because these may be old, but they've been known to walk away on their own. I'm calling this washer, but in some cases they're referred to as shims because yes it's supposed to allow the real table to spin freely but at the same time because manufacturing is is not you it wants to be a precise industry but you can't always depend on that so consequently the shims themselves can be different thicknesses because they want these real tables to be the right height so that the reel, when it's on there, the tape is going to wrap on here with a gap on the edges of the tape inside those reel tables. So <clears throat> the shim will adjust the height of the reel table so that the tape doesn't rub inside the reel as it's spinning onto there. And you'll find this in, <sighs> Let me put it this way. I've never not seen it. Okay. All right. So I've got a little bit of alcohol left on this. I know it, it evaporates over time. So I'm just cleaning this off. There's a little bit of dust buildup because the real tables, they just collect stuff. Debris, dust. There's no telling half the time. Using alcohol is a decent solvent in order to get any of that really nasty debris and old lubricant and whatever dust now use good old-fashioned windex and this is top secret <laughs> so <clears throat> not really it's simply green Get it? So, it's just what I prefer. Okay, let's screw a little bit on there. And now what I want to do is just make sure that any of these smudges that I'm seeing come up. That or it's a blemish in the metal and it seems to want to come up. Simple green does tend to streak. See how this thing actually turns brown? See that? That didn't come up with the alcohol, but it did come up with the simple green. Brown usually means nicotine, which means that this was probably in a smoking environment, which is, you know, 60 years ago. Nobody paid that much attention to it. Down here inside the motor, it's kind of dusty. And I can use this rag, this tech wipe, in order to get that. But there's also some dust built up underneath the, the uh, tape head wires and so forth. And not just that, but behind this little pressure pad tape door. So, and you want to be careful cleaning out behind this tape door because these little felt pads, they've been on there for over 60 years. And in all that time, they've been trying to figure out how to get loose. And you don't want to help them. In a lot of cases, those felt pads are just shot. So, I change them out. But honestly, these are in good shape. And they still stick. So, I'm going to leave it alone. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Really? Then why are you on YouTube? Oh, well. I don't have an answer for that. Actually, I do. But I promised I wouldn't say anything. <clears throat> so, here's what we're going to do. These areas down inside this little motor compartment, right down in there, rather than try to get in there with a rag, we're gonna use the Q-tip. All right, and just get that up nice and close. All right, and just going around and around, just trying to clean the top of that motor off. Now I'm using Simple Green for this, because I don't want to use the alcohol. Because I don't want to risk removing any lubricant on that motor shaft. Simple Green isn't going to attack it like alcohol would. 
So, but I will clean the shaft only with alcohol. Why? Well, it's been touching those rubber reel tables for a long time. So I want to be able to clean that off so that it'll have the right amount of friction. Actually, it's just have as much friction as it can get because the contact between that motor shaft and those reel tables, it's where the rubber meets the road. So. Put that on there. Because here's the deal. You can't put any kind of lubricant on that motor shaft because it's not going to work going to slip like it would want to so well it'll still have a little bit of moisture dampness left on this tech wipe i'm going to go ahead and clean these real shafts don't have to do a lot with it just you know clean that old lubricant off and then have i got a surprise for you i'm sure somebody else has already thought of it but before we do that i want to just take a little piece of paper towel because of this simple green had left that streaking on there and we're trying to deal with the cosmetic portion, portion, portion. So I just want to clean this with the Windex glass cleaner. But I also want to kind of try to do this all in the same direction, you know, to eliminate the streaking. Now, I can also admit, you know, most of this is going to be underneath the real tables. But, you know, nobody's going to see it. Well, if somebody takes this apart one day, they will. And I'd like to think that somebody's going to say, Oh, wow, man, somebody really cleaned underneath these real tables. Wow, a part that nobody's ever going to see. And from my grave, it'll be like, yep, cool. So there's that. <clears throat> Motor shaft is cleaned. Okay. Before I put these on, and before I lubricate that, I want to go ahead and try to clean these reel tables just a little bit. Okay. Get any kind of, oh, I don't know, maybe some oxidation. There's no telling what could be on these. I mean, I think I've already identified one chemical that may have built up on this rubber. I mean, it's coming clean a little bit. I mean, these are in really good shape. So, I mean, rubber rejuvenator, rubber rejuvenator. I'm saying that three times fast. I would call that one clean. Oh, that feels great. That's going to have plenty, plenty of friction on there. Also, want to clean any lubricant, the old lubricant that's left inside there. Okay. Came off the real shafts. Well, I've already cleaned those, but... This Q-tip is not going to fit through that hole. Okay, in fact, it's already coming out dirty. So, <clears throat> here's what we do. I'm going to peel off oh, about half of this Q-tip swabs stuff on there. I'm going to just put myself a little bit of alcohol on there. Find that one tip. Okay, go in there. Squeegee a little bit of that off and push that through, rotating this as I go. Okay. Oh my gosh. Look at that. That is nasty. But I don't want to pull it back through and just recontaminate the inside. So with these wooden ones, I just break that off. And then doesn't recontaminate that part inside there. Now this end is not going to go through there, but I do want to just sort of push one more tip through there in order to, boy, we got the good ones that this last time. <clears throat> Didn't want to quite come off of there. So I've got to grab another one. Yeah, I keep saying Q-tip. I can promise you these are not Q-tip swabs. Nothing against the Q-Tip Corporation. But the cardboard sticks? Nah. 
So, just want to push that through. Oh, that came out clean. It came out clean, but still going to break it off so I don't pull that back through. So this reel table is ready to go on there. But we're not going to use machine oil or three-in-one oil. I'm going to use Teflon. Honestly, if they didn't have Teflon back when this was made, it had been in a whole lot better shape. <clears throat> now, one of the things I wanted to like to point out is in order to reduce friction, what has been done here is that this reel shaft actually has a shallower center section. So there's this part up here, which is thicker in diameter, and this bottom part down here, thicker in diameter, but the inside here is not. That's to reduce friction. That way the reel table is not spinning on all of that metal. So they removed some metal in the center area so that only this part in the bottom and this part on top is actually going to get the lubricant. That said, I'm gonna do is honestly if you just put if you just put a bead on there it's too much what i like to do is to just squeeze it out to wet the tip of the tube and touch it okay and just touch it that's all it needs okay because once you put the reel table on there and spin it it's already doing its job okay now one last thing want to put this washer on there and just put it on there just just enough okay and then let the real table do the rest okay and it just sets right on there okay that's that's awesome that right there it's got no friction on there whatsoever so that's a good thing. We'll put the set screw back on there. Okay. And we just snug it up just a little bit. I like to go a little bit more than finger tight. You know, in case somebody starts to fiddle with it or something like that, they're not going to be able to take it off with their fingertips. Okay, so it's on there very tight. But that is the way that should behave. All right, so this shaft is clean. Just going to clean this out and install it. But this one is really dirty. As it comes clean, it actually gets a little harder to get this tech wipe to actually wipe it down. It sticks to the rubber pretty well. Okay, so at this point, uh, the real tables are all done. All that cosmetic stuff is on the other side is all done. So what I'm going to do now is put the case back together. The battery compartment is actually held in by four screws, two of which I had put back in in order to hold it in place while I was working on it. So I'm going to remove those screws, which our ferrous and magnetic screwdriver works. Okay, so now the battery compartment is loose and just wanna, you know, double check, make sure all the wires, nothing's pinched or anything like that. They've got this little piece of card, cardboard, I'm not sure which, but it's an insulator and it's basically just to protect the battery compartment from coming into contact with any of the any of the uh, leads that go to the batteries themselves from actually touching any other part inside the chassis. We put that back in and we put these screws back in. There was a uh, battery diagram in here which showed how the batteries are supposed to go in. In order to get to these screws, I had to take that out and it 
practically fell apart, you know, because it had just it had been in there for so long. Um, and this battery compartment is really not all that corroded. Um, so it was in good shape, but just getting that little piece of paper out of there um, was a problem because, of, you know, it was practically the whole entire part of it was glued in place. So getting it out to get to the screw holes, what I like to try to do is that little diagram, I'd like to try to get that out intact, set it aside, do the work, and then when I put it back together, it goes back in. Uh, but that one was just, it was not going to behave. So the battery compartment is back in. There is the head cover. Ta-da! Okay, that's going to go right over the top of this. And it's in, I mean, it's really in pristine shape. I am going to hit it real quick with some glass cleaner. Shouldn't need a solvent on this at all. So just sort of buff it up a little bit. Sometimes you want to be careful because you don't want to, sometimes the lettering on there is chipping and you end up having to take some really tiny paint brushes and try to repaint that. Now it's, it's embossed into the metal also don't want to actually create more work for yourself. Well, this just fits right back over the top of that. And these posts have threaded holes in there for the screws. Okay. Just leave that screw in there. Snug, but not tight. Until I get this other one in, get the holes all lined up. There's only two, so I'll just snug that one up and this one. Very cool. Now, I'm ready to put the case back over the top of this. I want to make sure that everything still works before I button it all up. And because something may have happened, you know, and I just don't like doing a job twice. So I'm going to put these batteries in place. We'll just throw a tape on here real quick. Just to see what just to see what we can hear. And I won't lie to you, these tiny little reels. I mean, they're adorable, but they can be a pain in the butt. Right. Um, I believe that later on in this tape, uh, there is actual recording. But don't make a liar out of me. Here we go. All right, I'm going to show you something here. Now, this is the take-up reel, okay? It's pulling the tape through there. But if you look closely, all right, you can see where the re the tape itself is really close to this edge inside the reel than this edge. That's what the shims are supposed to take care of. They're supposed to adjust that height of that reel table so that the tape actually packs onto the reel with equidistant, you know, so that there's as much gap above as below. This one's not doing that, okay? Despite the fact that I put the shims that came off on those shafts back exactly one for one, which, you know, one supply side, one the other take-up side, I put them back where they were. But this is actually the first that I've ever got to see this little unit work. So, and now I would like to test the recording process. I want to be careful not to erase anything that might actually still be on the tape. So we're just going to check this out. Four, five, six, seven, eight. All right. So there's something there, but nothing there. I rewound it. Now I'm going to make what I call a paper cue because I want to be careful not to go to that part of the tape. So I'm just going to take and grab a little piece of post-it paper and I'm going to insert this into the reel backed it up a little bit 
I'm going to just put this paper cue in there. All right. And that's going to mark where the recording is. I'm going to back up. Okay. And there's nothing on there. Test the recording process. And this top jack right here is the microphone input. So plug that in. I'm going to press the record button and the forward button, play if you will. And five, four, three, two, one. Okay, <clears throat> that's a good recording, but not terribly loud. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this up because I'm thinking that the volume control does record the, excuse me, does adjust the recording level. All right, so just real quick, I'm gonna do this again. Try not to go past my paper cue. Five, four, three, two, one. And we can go back. Yep. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> the recording is working. Playback is working. So uh, I'm satisfied. Save that microphone. But this is, by the way, this is a crystal microphone. And uh, crystal microphones will tend to have a higher output than, say, a dynamic microphone. Dynamic microphone is going to have a magnet built into it. Crystal microphones do not. It's actually a piezo electric transducer. And so it actually is going to have a higher output level. So this is good to go. So I'm going to go ahead and begin to button this up. This is the case, the bottom part of the case, but still got some snots in there and things like that. So I'm going to clean this up before I actually put it back on there. Don't think I'm going to need any uh, alcohol to do this. So I'm just going to stick with the simple green. I'm just going to wipe this out, collect any of this debris that might be in there. Just Even the little red handle on this is in really good shape. All the printing is clearly visible. I'm actually going to go ahead and work off of this end and get everything aligned going in that way. And then press the record button so that it clears the case, making sure that these jacks fit the holes properly. Functions still are working. We have some sound. Cool. Rewind. Good. Whoops. See, that rewind button stuck, which means it's rubbing on the case. And I'm noticing... There we go. The brakes were engaged. There we go. Okay. Now it's behaving. I'm also noticing that the screw holes, actually the case here, the, the case and then the transport itself, all right, wants to be a little bit higher before I put the screws in. And you just put these in there and snug them up a little bit. You leave them loose. You wait to tighten them all up. Okay, so that much is good there. I also got this off the shelf in the museum. Again, this is the cover. It looks a little dingy, but the real upside here is that there are no dents or dings. The little window here is nice and tight, so it's not likely to uh, 
fall out or anything like that. So now, just going to use some regular old paper towel with some Windex. See if I can get some of this dingy off of this metal. Not a lot coming off. So, that said, we'll try a little bit of Simple Green. Just do a test area. Not seeing much. Make sure that this lid fits on there properly. Oh yeah. This is the battery door. It covers up the uh, batteries, which looks good on the outside, but this inside part here, this is supposed to be foam that puts a little bit of pressure on the batteries just to make sure it holds them in place. Um, but this is totally deteriorated. In fact, it's actually falling off, it's crumbling. What I intend to do so I'm going to clean all of this old foam off. Now there's going to be a, a trace of old glue on there. I'm going to leave that, but I'm going to actually replace that foam with some very thin square of foam in order to do what this foam is supposed to do. Now it's not going to take much foam at all. Just a very, very thin piece because the idea is to just touch the batteries and not actually put a lot of pressure on them. And there isn't really much in the way of a gap. So I'm kind of curious how much space there really is in there. I know that this pad of post-its is too thick. Just lay that in there. That thickness of post-its is too thick. So we'll go with about half. Let's see if the door will actually lock. It feels really tight. That gives me an idea. In fact, it even left a mark. But that thickness right there is still too thick, which means that whatever I put on this, as far as the foam is concerned, <clears throat> is gonna be really thin. Just the door itself. Okay, so that's locked. I mean, that might be just good enough as it is. Of course, I just, I don't like how ugly that glue trace is on there. So I got a piece of foam here, but I'm actually of the opinion that it's gonna be too thick. I mean, it will collapse, but even fully collapse, it's gonna, I really think it's gonna interfere wants to spring back open, but what it's not doing is it's not causing the battery door to bow. So that, in my opinion, is going to be just fine. So I'll just glue this in place onto the door. It'll hide most of the blemish. It hides all of it. So there we go. <clears throat> I'll put some glue on that, set it in place, and then we done. So there you have it. And as I've often said, don't downplay small beginnings. And that was a small beginning. We're gonna be looking into working on a vintage VTR, video tape recorder, not VCR. No, he didn't misspeak. Okay, VTR. And all I'm gonna to try to do is to replace a belt. 
Okay, well, it unit shows up with a belt and it works fine, but I want to put a new belt in there and we're going to talk about what a fiasco that was in our next episode. Be sure to hit that like button if you liked it, okay? And we're welcoming your comments. We'll even reply to them if we, you know, can find the time. And also subscribe, okay? Because we'd like to let you know that we've got a new video coming up. So until then, I'm Tim. This is 6R. Thanks for watching.